I'm Jake Maskowitz. Uh, I worked with uh, Benjamin Ellis, James Meradian, and Professor Avav Shockham. Uh, we're all from UC San Diego. Uh, we exploited a Logitech G600 gaming mouse. Uh, so to talk a little bit about our motivation, uh, last summer news came out uh, that in December of 2011, the Economic Development Administration believed they were under a large-scale cyber attack uh, and that all of their machines were compromised, uh, and their solution was to go about destroying over $3 million worth of their computers, but not only their computers, their monitors, their keyboards, their all of their peripherals. Uh, uh -oh. Uh, and they only stopped destroying hardware because they actually ran out of money to continue destroying hardware. Uh, it turns out this was a big mistake because they were not actually under a large-scale attack. It was a small number of machines with a fairly conventional uh, virus on them, and there was just a miscommunication between the IT and the higher-ups uh, that led to this destruction. Uh, and so many news organizations made fun of the EDA, uh, said they were baffled by modern technology. Um, we liked this article from The Verge that said, indeed, throwing away computer mice seems like a poor approach to ridding an organization of digital threats. Um, and, and this just was the, showed the widespread public perception that, oh, a mouse, you know, a printer, a mouse can't get a virus. So we just had to see, can we give a mouse a virus? Uh, so our goal was to create a persistent threat uh, in the mouse, such that uh, when a machine is, is cleaned out of the malware, the mouse can reinfect this. And so uh, our goals to do this, our steps were first to compromise the mouse via a firmware update attack, and then to have that mouse send malicious keyboard and mouse commands to the host machine to then do any sort of malicious task that you'd like it to. Uh, so to break down the attack mall a little bit more, uh, we, we thought there, there are two parts to this attack. First, you need to infect the mouse, then you need to exploit the host machine. And we thought about two main scenarios for this, one where the machine you're, use, you're exploiting is connected to a network, and one where it's not connected to the network. Uh, so if it's connected to the network, uh, infecting the mouse is actually fairly straightforward. Uh, we can use conventional methods such as drive-by download or a Trojan horse. As soon as we get any user-level code running on the machine, we can update the firmware of the mouse because the mouse is updated over USB. USB is not a protected resource. Any user level code can update the mouse's firmware. Uh, additionally, we, we saw that the Logitech firmware updater uh, binary from Logitech was served over HTTP. So you could do a man in the middle attack and serve your own updater when they go to get the legitimate updater for their mouse. Uh, in the case for an air-gapped host, uh, we have to be a little more creative, but Fortunately, uh, a security firm, NetroGuard, has done this for us. They, uh, as part of a pen test, uh, mailed a promotional gift mouse to the company they were trying to infiltrate uh, with modified hardware inside of it, and it worked. The user inside the organization used the mouse, plugged it right into the machine they were targeting, uh, and it worked perfectly for them. Uh, then we have how we're going to exploit the machine once we have the mouse connected to it and the mouse has been infected. Uh, if it's a networked machine, the mouse can simply send commands up to the host machine to then download some malware from the internet and execute it. Uh, and we say, what do we gain, right? Why don't we just do this in the original drive-by download to get our malware on there? Well, let's say the user cleans their computer either through antivirus or wiping their, wiping their computer or destroying their computers and buying new ones. Uh, the mouse hasn't been affected. It can just talk to the new host, get new malware, and bring it right back down, giving us a persistent threat. Uh, however, in the case for an, uh, for an air-gapped machine, uh, we can't download the malware from the internet because we're not connected to the internet. Uh, so the mouse has to have somehow carry the malware inside of it and in some method upload it to the machine. And I'll talk about some of those methods in a bit. All right, so an overview of the actual mouse we chose. Uh, we decided to look at gaming mice first because they tend to be a little more complicated. They're more likely to have firmware updates. Uh, we went to an uh, industry leader with Logitech uh, and looked through their site and found that the Logitech G600 had a firmware update available on their website. And when we uh, used a resource extractor to look in this EXE, we found iHex firmware images just inside the EXE that we could pull out and actually get the firmware binaries and then start to reverse them. Uh, so then we bought ourselves a Logitech G600 and took it apart uh, and found that it used a known microcontroller with a data sheet available online, the Atmel AT Mega 32U2. Uh, and now that we had the data sheet, we had the firmware, we were, we were good to go. Um, so to talk a little bit about uh, this specific mouse that we did and most embedded software in general, uh, there are two segments to the firmware, the application segment and the bootloader segment. Uh, 
Uh, the application segment is normal operation, in this case, mouse clicks and mouse movement. Uh, and the bootloader segment has additional privileges, like flashing memory, uh, and, and that's where the firmware updates happen on the mouse here. Um, and then for the G600 specifically, uh, as a gaming mouse, it has these 12 buttons on the side that you can program for whatever sort of gaming things you're going to be doing. Uh, but the default operation of the mouse here is that it, it's a numpad. Uh, and so what we did was we hooked the mouse into our computer and did some USB PCAP and looked first at how what happened when we pressed the button. Uh, so here we found that uh, we found four different packet, USB packets being sent when we pressed the single button, the one button on our numpad. Uh, our first packet we discovered was the, this one E here is the USB HID code for a one. After that, we saw this other pattern that took us a little while to figure out, but as soon as we pressed two buttons, we realized it was a bit flag representing which buttons are being pressed down. So uh, there was, for each button, you have a bit. When that button is down, the bit is set. When the button is released, the bit is cleared. And so if you look at these other two messages, when we release the button, it sends zeros to say this button is up. And so with this knowledge, uh, it was time to start looking at the firmware. Uh, so we started by reading the manual, which was very long and took a long time, so I'm going to fast forward a little bit. In the end, we had annotated over 160 functions, which is over 4,000 lines of assembly. Uh, we identified several libraries, including a USB library and a math library inside of this firmware. Uh, once we had f discovered all the parts of the firmware uh, that we wanted, we found the USB functions. Uh, that were sending the USB, we found the, the actual parts that were handling the button presses. We were able to write uh, our own small piece of firmware that could do some specific button presses that we wanted. Uh, we packaged that up into an iHex file, dropped it right back into Logitech's, uh, Logitech's firmware updater, uh, and then just flashed the mouse by running Logitech's own firmware updater with our firmware inside of it. Uh, so what can our malicious mouse now actually do now that we have this firmware in it? And the answer is a lot. So uh, our, f our first malware just looked like this. Is a, when you connect the mouse, uh, we can hit Windows R to bring up the, the run prompt. We launch PowerShell and we do a start bits transfer, which is the PowerShell, PowerShell equivalent of like wget. Uh, we can download any arbitrary file from the internet and execute it and then exit. And this actually uh, flashes on and off the screen in under a second. Uh, so it just looks like Windows being Windows. And, uh, in the case of the air-gapped machine, uh, we again will do a Windows R and launch command.exe, and as real programmers, we type our binary in directly using CopyCon. Uh, so we can use alt key combos to just literally type out the bytes of the binary that is inside of, that we can embed inside the firmware of the mouse. The mouse had about six kilobytes of free space for whatever sort of binary you'd want to fit in there, and we could just send any arbitrary binary directly to file through the command line. Uh, as for triggering this mechanism, uh, we found that two, we found two 8-bit registers that weren't being used in the firmware through static analysis. Uh, and so we counted button presses at first, so on the nth button press we can send our payload. The mouse also, the, the, uh, the microcontroller, the ATmega32U2, has a timer, timing system in it that we also could connect to for our counter to trigger uh, not all of the time. Uh, so to talk about some mitigations for this, ways to prevent this in, in future mice, uh, the firmware needs to be signed. We need to have cryptographic signing of the firmware images themselves. Uh, the actual Logitech update binary had some Windows code signing on it, but that, that actually gave us a different warning once we put our firmware in it. But it, we didn't notice until the very end of our research because the UAC prompt looks nearly identical for the signed updater versus the unsigned updater, and so many legitimate updaters are unsigned. So what actually, where the signing needs to be is on the firmware itself and then verified by the mouse when it receives the firmware update. It needs to verify with an embedded public key that it, this firmware came from Logitech and is not malicious firmware. Uh, to show that this is feasible, uh, we implemented uh, RSA signature verification using PKCS 1.5 and a low footprint hash called Spongent. Uh, our signature verification code was about 1.5 kilobytes uh, after uh, running the compiler to optimize for size. Um, Looking at the size of the bootloader for our mouse and the amount of size used, we think this is reasonable. 
uh, and we think that s some programmers with more embedded device experience could probably get this even smaller, and so we think this is a reasonable mitigation. Uh, so in conclusion, we demonstrated an end-to-end -end evaluation of using mice as a persistent malware delivery mechanism. We demonstrated RSA signatures can be a feasible mitigation. Um, and we believe that all firmware up updates should be signed, uh, and all embedded devices should verify the update signatures. Uh, previous research has shown that this is not limited to mice. Uh, Kui et al. showed this with printers. Brocker and Checkaway used, did this with the MacBook webcam. Uh, Chen did this with the Apple wireless keyboard. All of these peripherals are vul vulnerable, not just mice, and so we, they all need to be verifying their firmware updates. Um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my partners, Ben Ellis and James Meradian, my advisor, Havav Shakam. Uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge Keaton Mowry and David Kolbrenner for helping us out with IDA, um, Samuel Chen for helping us out with JTAG, and Michael Walter for translating a German article for our related work. Thank you. Did you look at turning the mouse into a composite USB device that is both an HID and mass storage device? Right, so we, we looked into it a little bit and decided that our time we better spend just focusing on the mouse, but that was definitely something we considered doing. Uh, we could have the mouse report as a mass storage device uh, and then just have the malware be a file on there and just click on it. Uh, we could have, we could also, there's a paper that had a USB device report as a firmware to USB adapter uh, and then have the firmware device plugged into it, request direct memory access, and then certain USB drivers will allow this. <laughs> yeah, so following the previous question, uh, so if you're like talking about air gap machine, then uh, you not only have to type in your binary to infect it, but you have to also exfiltra exfiltrate the data from that machine right. back to the mouse. So is it possible to actually write something to the mouse? Or does uh, the storage? And so in the same way that we can update the firmware of the mouse, we can use that to write things back out to the mouse. That's all over USB happening in user land. Uh, we could also have the mouse, uh, you know, with you can write completely custom firmware for the mouse. You can write whatever you want. So you could have the mouse do some sort of communication Wait, protocol. Do with you have mouse. enough space to write uh, actually? Like so you would probably have to, we, we had six kilobytes of space in the application section. Um, which would be a reasonable amount of space to do certain things. Uh, you could also, uh, the mouse we were looking at had various features that you could likely disable. There's, a, there's rotating LED lights and things like that, and uh, I, it might not be as suspicious if those lights stop working, but you were able to get other functionality. And following this question, what was the whole purpose of doing this? If you could just disassemble the mouse and like, put your own controller into it, you know, like your own flash drive in it, and like I'm not talking about make, turn it in, into a USB, uh, mass storage, but like, mm -hmm. like basically, right. throw, throw all this Atmel to put crap, a different, you know, put, put different like Raspberry Pi in it. And, you know, uh, the advantage here is that you don't need physical access to the mouse in certain scenarios. So if you if you know that a certain target is ha uses a certain brand of mice or a certain model of mouse, you can using the you know drive by download or other techniques, we can we can just use use the mice they already have and not have to have physical access to the mouse. Okay, thanks. visually looking at it, but not checking if there's malicious firmware on it. They're going to say, oh, right. okay, it looks great, put it back in, right? But so it would be right. obvious if it was fake hardware, but not obvious if it's fake firmware. So in, in the case of a wireless mouse, you would presumably you would have firmware in the mouse itself and in the sort of in the wireless yeah, you know, so, so for, for, I mean, you also have, uh, you also have firmware in the, the, uh, the laser. Uh, the laser, there's usually a chip controlling the laser and you have firmware in there as well. Uh, if it's a Bluetooth mouse, you have the Bluetooth. Yeah, yeah there's so several like, microphones. So if it's a Bluetooth mouse, right? So did you look to see if the, like, if the Bluetooth module itself, if you know, if that has enough computing power to do like public key signature verification, or? Uh, so we didn't we didn't actually look at for those smaller mice. So we were just looking at the main uh, the main controller for the uh, for this mouse uh, because that's the only one open to a firmware update uh, from the host machine. Of the it, it it handles the USB communication. It's the only one communicating with the host machine. Um, I believe my question is very similar to his. Uh, Luke Desitels from North Carolina State University. Um, I know the NSA has agents playing World of Warcraft, and they might have gaming mice, but 
Are there other advanced types of mice or, or reasons that a gaming mouse would be a particular vulnerability to large agencies? Uh, so there are other mice that are not gaming mice that have firmware updates. Uh, we just went to gaming mouse mice because we were familiar with them and we knew for a fact they had firmware updates that we knew where to get them. Uh, there are other mice that have firmware updates. Um, so I would like to know when you played uh, with the firmware, did you also learn something about uh, the optical mouse component? I mean, basically this a mouse, an optical mouse, not a mechanical one, has some kind of camera inside that films the surface. Um, can you maybe do nasty things with that, like scanning the environment or scanning documents beneath the mouse? So right well, while we were uh, working on this, there was an article that came out of uh, some hacks that people had done where they had, were scanning things using the optical part of the mouse, um, using similar techniques that, you know, they changed the firmware on the mouse and were scanning things. There was also an article, the German article that was translated for us that uh, Allegedly, they had a mouse that they received at a conference that was manufactured in China mm -hmm. that when they moved it over a certain pattern on the mouse pad, it had, it had certain behavior. It was a really interesting article uh, that their, their trigger, instead of a time-based trigger, was the actual image that the optical mouse, the optical scanner was receiving. Uh, do you link these things in the paper? Uh, yes, all, they're in the references to the paper. So I'm confused. It's a mouse. I move it around and I click on stuff. Why does it have the ability to update the firmware? Uh, so for gaming mice, the reason is usually there's often, because they're more complicated and there's, there's higher performance requirements and people will be angry if they don't get the exact amount of uh, millisecond efficiency, uh, that you can, they can put out firmware updates to update these things. Uh, but in general, you're going to have upda firmware updates for your device because the, you have the software, there's going to be a bug in it, you're, you know, your users are going to complain, you need the ability to address that, and so they, they leave the ability in just in case. And often if there's even one firmware update, we can reverse that and figure out their entire update process. All right, thank you. <laughs>